Today we're out here on the Oregon coast with the all new 2019 Subaru Ascent. This is the biggest Subaru that they've ever built. It also is the cup holderest Subaru ever built. There are 19 cup holders in this cabin, which is an absolutely insane number. And you can get it as either a seven passenger or an eight passenger vehicle. So if you've been looking for a larger Subaru Outback, this is exactly what the doctor ordered. Up front, you'll find standard halogen headlamps. LED headlamps are available, as are LED fog lamps down lower on the bumper. The front end looks very much like the rest of the Subaru lineup. We have this corporate grille going on right here, and the styling is definitely more conservative than the last time Subaru tried to make a three-row crossover. The Tribeca didn't sell all that well. Some people think it was because it was a little bit smaller than the competition. Some people think it had to do with the aesthetics. Either way, this three-row crossover has none of those problems. It definitely has the handsome good looks that we see from the rest of the Subaru lineup, and it's almost exactly the same size as the Highlander and the Pilot. From the side profile, the Ascent certainly looks like a member of the family as well. We have the traditional long hood design that we see in other Subaru models because we still have a four-cylinder boxer engine under the hood, and that makes the hood a little bit longer than some of the competition. It also helps give this a profile that looks very much like an over-inflated Outback. It's, again, quite an attractive look. Something I'd like to point out while we're looking at the side is that we have a very square rear door right here that helps people get in and out of the third row. Some of the options in this segment, they tend to slant up right there. Oftentimes that's for crash reasons, helps improve the structure, but because we have this very square opening, it helps get people in and out of the back a little bit more easily. Now this is a three row crossover, so we have the same sort of shape that we see back here in other three row crossovers, and this is 196.8 inches long. That makes us about three inches shorter than a Mazda CX-9, but about four inches longer actually than a Toyota Highlander. And a lot of that length difference actually is up there in the hood versus the Toyota. Again, out back, this looks like a member of the family. We have partial LED tail lamp modules. The brake lights are LEDs, as are the parking lights, but the turn signals are actually incandescent bulbs, as are the backup lamps. We have dual exhausts lower on the bumper, a lot of black cladding going on right there, well-integrated parking sensors. And the reason this rear bumper looks like it comes in three separate pieces is because the tow hitch receiver is hiding right here under this center portion. So if you remove that, you'll find the receiver down there. Towing could come in at up to 5,000 pounds, depending on how you have this equipped. As you'd expect out of a Subaru, we have a four-cylinder boxer engine under this hood. It's an all-new design. It's a 2.4-liter engine, produces 260 horsepower and 277 pound-feet of torque. That's more torque than the average entry in this segment, but a little bit less than the Mazda CX-9. Power is routed to all four wheels by default, again, because this is a Subaru, and all-wheel drive is standard on almost every Subaru model. Instead of using a traditional stepped automatic transmission like we find in the competition, this uses a CVT like we see in most Subarus these days. Fuel economy comes in at 22 miles per gallon to 23 miles per gallon combined, depending on the options that you get. That puts this right in the thick of things versus the six-cylinder competition. It is just a little bit below the CX-9, it actually is pretty similar to the Pilot and the Highlander. Subaru is obviously a brand with a go-anywhere personality, so not only is all-wheel drive standard in this model, 8.7 inches of ground clearance is also standard. Most Subaru models in the U.S. are definitely higher off the ground than their direct competitors, and that's certainly true of this. This is about 7 tenths of an inch higher than a Toyota Highlander and well over an inch higher than a Honda Pilot. Front seat comfort is quite good on the driver's side, but it is important to know that even in this top end trim, the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver. It's just a four-way passenger seat, so it does not move up and down, and the seat bottom cushion does not tilt. It also doesn't have the power adjustable lumbar support that we see on this side. Now, a nice touch in this model, however, is that we do have an extending thigh cushion, which is a feature that I really appreciate, as will drivers that are taller than me. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion, it's very easy to find a good driving position in this vehicle. We have a two-position seat memory right over there on the door and a very generous amount of headroom, even though we're in the model with the optional panoramic moonroof. Hopping into the back seat, we find a surprising amount of legroom. This is about two inches more combined legroom, and that's front row plus second row plus third row, than the Toyota Highlander. It's also a little bit more even than the Honda Pilot. But this does come in a little bit behind some of those larger crossovers like the Nissan Pathfinder. With this front seat adjuster for me at six feet tall, I have several inches of legroom left. To help apportion legroom a little bit more equitably, the second row slides forwards and backwards. Now the model that we're driving is the top end touring trim. This is available only as a seven passenger vehicle. Base versions of the Ascent are eight passenger only. Top end trims are seven passenger only and the trims in between are available as either seven or eight passenger vehicles. So we have the captain's chairs right here, as I said before, otherwise it would be a bench. 
Moving all the way over to this side, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. You can see I still have several inches of legroom left. And from this angle, you can see that we have the integrated window shades in the model that we're driving. A nice touch in this cabin is that we do have standard tri-zone climate control. We also have heated seats back here in the second row, a 120 volt inverter, two extra USB charge ports, two cup holders that fold out of the center console, one bottle holder in this door up high, and then some additional bottle and storage below that. If you're a family that has kids that are still in child seats, there's an important thing you need to know about this Subaru. Unlike some of the other three row crossovers that we see in America, especially things like the Volkswagen Atlas and the Nissan Pathfinder, you cannot have a child seat that is forward facing, latched into position, and still tilt and slide these seats forward. That's because of the way these seats move. So you can see the seat back actually moves forward, making the angle between the back and the bottom cushion more acute, and then the seat slides forward. Now, you can, of course, just slide the seat forward. However, there's not quite enough room to get through there for some people. Now, I just barely can escape but it is a pretty tight squeeze. And of course, it depends on how far forward the front seat is sitting. That's one of the reasons that Subaru gives us this very square rear door opening. If this was a little bit more slanted forward like we see in some of the competition, that move wouldn't even be possible. Accessing the third row is pretty easy because the second row seats are quite light. And that is something that I appreciate because not every three row crossover out there has seats that can really be handled by children. If I move this back into place and tilt it backwards, then you see I do have a decent amount of legroom. Now this second row seat is not all the way back in its tracks, but I do have enough room to sit comfortably up front with myself in the front seat, myself in the second seat, and me back here in the third. Unfortunately, at six feet tall, there's just not enough headroom back here to actually have your head hit the headrest. You do have to kind of crane your head to one side. It's also worth noting that the center seat belt comes out of the ceiling. That's not my preference for a center seat belt. When it comes to child latch anchors, you do find one set of latch anchors back here in the third row and latch anchors in each of these captain's chairs in the second row. If you opted for the second row bench seat, then you do get three sets of child latch anchors. Subaru made sure to give us a lot of little touches even back here in the third row. Now, obviously, we still find hard plastics like we find in most three row crossovers. The reason for that, of course, is that a lot of people will keep their third row seats folded most of the time, use this for cargo, and softer plastics are not going to be as durable as harder plastics. But we still have speakers back here. We have USB charge ports. There are actually two right there on that side. The three passengers back here get five cup holders total, three on one side, two on the other. These cup holders are capable of handling sippy cups with the handles on the side, and you can even put a large iPad right there in the slot. Rear seat passengers also get their own reading lights and dedicated air vents. A little handle right here on the second row captain's chairs to help you get up and move forward. Speaking in general terms, vehicles with longitudinal engine layouts like the Dodge Durango and interestingly enough, this Subaru, tend to have slightly less efficient packaging overall, and that means interior space for the exterior dimensions. But this is where the Subaru is a little bit different, because of course it was designed for that four-cylinder boxer engine, which is actually quite compact. So even though it is sitting longitudinally in the vehicle, it doesn't really take up as much room, obviously, as we find the V8 engines or V6 engines under the hood of the Dodge Durango. And that's how we actually have more cargo room back here in the third row, even though Subaru also manages to give us more interior leg room than something like a Toyota Highlander. At just under 18 cubic feet, this is still a little bit less room than you'll find in the Ford Explorer, but it is actually a little bit more than you find in most of the larger three row crossovers. If we lift up the load floor, we find yet more storage space and a place to store the roller cargo cover. That's a very practical feature because not every vehicle has a place where you can put the cover if you're not using it. As we look around this interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end trim. You'll find the telematics buttons over here, the SOS button and the information button to activate the system. The sunglass holder also has a rear mirror so that we can see what the kids are doing in the back. And the model that we're driving has one of the LCD rear view mirrors. These are a little bit interesting. I find the image to be a little bit hard to use sometimes, but if you do pack your vehicle full of stuff often, this is actually going to give you a view out the back that would normally be obstructed by bags. If I move out from there, you can see the housing for the eyesight system. Those are those two bumps right there. Moving back from there, you'll see the large panoramic moonroof in our particular model. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and the front passenger and four-way adjustable ratchet style headrests. So we simply ratchet those forward for the forward backward direction. The model that we're driving has the leather upholstery and these seats are perforated because they are both heated and ventilated in this particular trim. 
As with most vehicles in this segment, the doors are trimmed in a combination of hard and soft touch plastics. You'll find the hard plastics lower on the door, right around one of those bottle holders at the bottom, and then all the upper portion of the door is going to be soft touch plastic. We have imitation wood trim. It's fairly convincing, but it is still imitation wood. I actually wish that in this particular trim they'd invested in some real wood trim because we now find that in upper level trims of the competition, for instance the Mazda CX-9 in its top end signature trim, does have real wood. If we move on over to the dashboard, we find a lot of stitched materials. You'll find that in this ivory section right there on the bottom of the door. Moving on over to the dashboard, that's actually a hand-stitched piece. There's a little storage cubby right here where you can put smartphones. The upper section of the dashboard is an injection molded dashboard, but it is after stitched to make it match what's going on below. If we move on over to the center of the dashboard, we find two LCDs. This one up top is used for your trip computer. If we focus in there, you can see it a little bit better. Gives you trip computer information. You can also get a clock, audio system information, the status of the vehicle's active safety systems, the all-wheel drive system, etc. And then if we zoom out from there, we find a speaker grill, some buttons for that screen, hazard light button, and then the infotainment screen below that. The model that we're driving has the larger up-level system, which also includes factory navigation, but Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is now standard in all models. So basically, if you have a compatible smartphone, navigation becomes standard as well. There's some physical buttons below that, direct access buttons to radio, map, media, etc. And then we get the controls for the tri-zone automatic climate control. If you want to control the rear zone, we simply press this button right here, and then we can actually adjust that rear zone. You'll notice that that temperature is changing. If you want to press it again, then you can start adjusting the front zone separately. Below that, we have a storage cubby where I was very easily able to put my iPhone 7 Plus. One thing worth noting is that the USB ports are right here and visible. They're not tucked out of the way, which is my preference. Below that, we find the auto brake hold button that is standard, as is this X mode button, because of course all wheel drive is also standard. And then we have a pretty traditional console shifter right there between the front seats. You'll find the manual mode right back there with drive. So we simply toggle over to the left for that manual mode. And once in the manual mode, you use the shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel. There's no additional toggle right back there with the shifter. You'll find the electric parking brake right there and two large cup holders. The center armrest is softly padded and it opens to reveal a two-tiered storage compartment. We have one removable tier right there and then a fairly deep storage well. You can see those water bottles down there at the bottom. Now, as I said, there are no USB imports in that storage compartment, which I do think is a pity. The instrument cluster is pretty similar to other Subaru models. We have a physical speedometer and tachometer, and then a color multifunction display in the middle that gives us things like our trip computer information as well as our odometer. The steering wheel is a round three-spoke design that's very similar to other Subaru models as well. We have sport grips up top. Again, those paddle shifters on the back, down on the left, and up on the right over there. You'll control that multifunction display with these buttons down here on this side of the steering wheel, heated steering wheel option with that button right there. On this side of the steering wheel, you'll find the buttons for the adaptive cruise control system, as well as a button to enable and disable the lane keeping system. And then on this side of the steering wheel, we have the buttons for the infotainment system, dedicated phone buttons right down here, source change, voice command, track forward, backward, and volume up down. To the left of the driver, we see those seat memory buttons and another view of that imitation wood trim. Again, I wish this was real, but it actually is a fairly good impersonation of wood trim. Let's start out with the numbers. According to Subaru, this should go from 0 to 60 in 7.4 seconds. That puts it sort of in the thick of things in this segment. It's not the quickest entry, but neither is it the slowest entry. That should be right around the same as the V6 Toyota Highlander for 2018, as well as the Volkswagen Atlas, although remember the Atlas is a little bit larger than this. If you want to go from 0 to 60 faster than that, the GMC Acadia as well as versions of the Dodge Durango and the Ford Explorer will go faster because of course you can get them with more power. In an interesting twist, Subaru actually gives us an expected 60 to 0 braking score, so I'm going to pop that in at the top of your screen. It comes in at 127 feet, 60 miles an hour to 0. That sounds a little bit long. I actually expect that when we get this on our own home turf, it's going to stop a little bit shorter because we do have those standard 245 with tires. With those numbers out of the way, let's talk about how this drives. Obviously, we have a continuously variable transmission under the hood. Now, a lot of people dislike CVTs, but I've actually always been a fan of them. However, I will say that the one thing that I dislike about this CVT is that it imitates gear shifts. I personally prefer CVTs to just act like CVTs. The main reason for that would be acceleration performance. Acceleration performance in this vehicle would actually be better if it was not imitating an 8-speed stepped automatic transmission. You can really feel it because you're getting a decent amount of acceleration. This engine actually has quite a bit of low-end torque, and then the shift happens, and then the acceleration slows down a bit, and then again it picks up again after the shift. 
And of course the transmission wouldn't do that if it just varied the ratio as you were accelerating, just like CVTs used to. Of course, a lot of car reviewers and a few customers alike complained about the way CVTs behaved, and that's why a lot of manufacturers are making these transmissions imitate automatics. You can, of course, use the paddle shifters if you want to do that. It'll help you decelerate if you're going down a hill and you want to use the engine braking, but these shifts don't really feel like a traditional automatic. They feel sort of mushy would probably be the best way to describe it. Subaru tells us that they were targeting some of the best entries in this segment when it comes to overall handling ability, especially the Mazda CX-9. And you can feel that out on the road. Again, we have fairly wide tires even in the base trim. Of course, upper end trims of the CX-9 will have even wider tires, and I suspect the CX-9 will likely outhandle this in top end trims. But for the mainstream trims, especially the base model, this does very well for itself. Subaru has always spent a decent amount of time talking about their boxer engine and how that helps lower the center of gravity in the vehicle, and that's definitely true. We get a lot less body roll out of this than we do something like a Toyota Highlander or a Honda Pilot. Now, on the downside when it comes to absolute handling numbers, the boxer engine design puts the entire engine in front of the front axle, very much like we see in a lot of Audi's latest products like the Audi A4, A6, A8, etc. That means that although we have a low center of gravity, we actually have a less advantageous weight balance front to rear, and that does hamper handling. However, the vast majority of entries in this segment are going to have very similar weight balances to this. The weight balance is not really going to be that much different than a Honda Pilot or a Highlander or a Sorento or a CX-9. If you want a very well-balanced crossover in this group, your only option would actually be a V6 Dodge Durango because that does have a perfect 50-50 weight balance and it is a rear-wheel drive vehicle. So if you want the absolute handling champion, you would probably want to look at the CX-9 or the Dodge Durango. The Durango will give you those rear-wheel drive dynamics. Nothing else in this segment really will, even though this does have a longitudinal engine layout. That's because this Subaru transmission and all-wheel drive system are designed to send most of the power to the front wheels. Now, this is a permanent all-wheel drive system, so it's always trying to send some power to the rear axle, and that's what helps give Subarus their legendary traction in adverse weather conditions. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be the most capable off-road system in this segment. Again, that would be something like the Dodge Durango. It does have a low-ratio mode available with a true transfer case and a true locking center coupling. But again, unlike many of the competition, this is always going to send some power to the rear axle. And that means that if you're on snow or on ice or a very wet, slippery surface, this is going to feel far more sure-footed because there isn't going to be a moment where the front wheels are slipping and then power has to be sent to the rear. It's always going to be sending some of that power to the back. You can improve that, of course, by engaging the X mode button right down there in the center console. That will encourage the system to send even more power to the rear and it will also alter the way the stability control system and the traction control system function this vehicle to help give you better traction. In terms of overall curb weight, this comes in at 4,605 pounds for the model that we're driving right here. When you look at the spec sheets, it would appear that the Toyota Highlander is considerably lighter than this. But remember, the Highlander's base curb weight is for a front-wheel drive model with a four-cylinder engine, and it's a non-turbo four-cylinder. But the better comparison to this model would actually be the V6 Highlander because we get relatively similar power and torque numbers as well as performance figures out of this vehicle as the V6 Highlander. But when it comes to absolute handling ability, the wider tires that we have in this vehicle are definitely noticeable. Turbocharged engine is also definitely a team player, as we'll notice up here as we approach this passing lane, so we can pass the slow-moving minivan. You can definitely feel that this engine has an awful lot of mid-range torque. In addition to that, the CVT shifts relatively rapidly, so this doesn't feel quite as sluggish as something like the Nissan Pathfinder. Something that we've come to expect from Subaru is an excellent ride, and we aren't disappointed in this model. The suspension has a great deal of travel, thanks to the high ground clearance that we have in this model, and it definitely soaks up bumps out on the road. I think this is almost on the verge of being a little bit too soft, but because the suspension is well controlled and we don't really have much body roll, it's not really a problem when it comes to handling. If you're looking for a solid highway cruiser, this is definitely going to be an excellent option. The cabin is also very quiet. This is another area where Subaru was definitely targeting the best in this segment. According to them, they're claiming that this is going to be quieter out on the road than the Pilot and the Highlander and comes in a very close second to the CX-9, which is one of the quietest entries in this group. In terms of overall fuel economy, we've been averaging between 20 and 23 miles per gallon over a day of mixed driving in this vehicle. Basically, that puts this right where Subaru is telling us that it should be. This is going to be about as fuel efficient as the V6 that we find in the Toyota Highlander, but again, a little bit less efficient than the Mazda CX-9, as I said earlier. 
That actually surprised me a little bit, of course, because this has a continuously variable transmission and the CX-9 does not. Generally speaking, continuously variable transmissions really help improve fuel economy, especially in mixed driving cycles. And it's interesting that this is actually one mile per gallon below the CX-9. CX-9 does very, very well in real world driving as well. Now, again, this has a full-time all-wheel drive system, so that may have something to do with that because the CX-9 will prioritize power to the front wheels and disconnect the rear wheels quite readily. The result, of course, is that you're going to have less loss when it's doing that, but it's not going to feel quite as sure-footed on some surfaces. Overall, the Ascent is very impressive out on the road. If you were looking for something that felt like a larger Outback, then this is definitely going to be the vehicle for you. Although, I would argue that this actually feels a little bit more engaging than some versions of the Outback. Sometimes the Outback, to me, feels just a little bit too soft. This feels just a little bit firmer, perhaps, than that. This is definitely a very competent three-row crossover. Now, obviously, if you're looking for something sporty, this is not going to be the way to go. You're probably going to want to look at some of the other Subaru models. But if you're looking for a three-row crossover that still feels like a Subaru out on the road, then this is exactly what you're looking for. According to Subaru, you should be able to get your hands on one of these come June because they're already in production and they're already shipping out to dealers. Base models will start at $31,995. That is about $1,000 more than the base price of some of its direct competitors. But keep in mind, we have standard all-wheel drive, and that really does make a big difference when it comes to value because a base all-wheel drive V6 Highlander will actually start at $34,540, and a Honda Pilot all-wheel drive will start at $32,800, both notably more than this Subaru. Digging a little bit deeper into the numbers, that means that you could get a premium trim of this Subaru for the same price as the base V6 Toyota Highlander. The limited trim will set you back $38,995. The model that we're driving right here is $44,695 because this is the top-end touring trim. It's also worth noting that the top-end touring trim is actually less expensive than many of the competition's top-end models. For instance, a Honda Pilot will end up at around $47,500 fully equipped. Obviously, it does have a few more goodies and gadgets that we don't find in this vehicle, but it's going to cost you an awful lot more. One of the big reasons that you'd want to get the Subaru over some of the competition is the value proposition, especially in base and mid-level trims. If you're looking for an inexpensive three-row crossover with all-wheel drive, this is definitely an excellent option. In addition to the standard all-wheel drive system, however, Subaru also gives us a great deal of standard equipment even in the base model. Subaru gives us standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in every model. 245 with tires are also standard in every trim, and we have the new EyeSight system also standard. In the past, EyeSight, which is Subaru's encompassing safety system, was optional, but not for this model. This is actually now standard. That gives us adaptive cruise control functionality, pre-collision warning, and pre-collision braking. Other manufacturers have been pretty aggressive at bringing those features down even into their core models, but not that many manufacturers make that kind of technology standard in every trim. As you work your way up the trim ladder, the value proposition for the Ascent starts to soften just a little bit. But it is still a very good deal even in that top-end trim because top-end trims of the competition will cost you a little bit more. It's worth mentioning that I personally found the passenger seat in the front of this top-end touring trim to be less comfortable than many of the competition's top-end trims. It's also worth noting that for a vehicle that is designed to be very family friendly, the second row seats in this vehicle will not fold forward if you have a child seat latched into place. That means that if you have two child seats latched into the second row, your options for accessing the third row become a little bit more limited. You would either have to climb through the middle if you have the captain's chairs, climb over the seat back if you have the bench seat, or you'd have to be able to squeeze between that second row seat when it slid all the way forward and then the door jam in the back. You will, of course, have to wait until we can get our hands on one of these for a complete week so we can run through our usual battery of tests, give you official zero to 60 numbers, and do our complete comparison section. In the meantime, be sure and let me know what you think about the Ascent down there in the comments section below. Let me know how much you value that standard all-wheel drive system especially. You can also click down there to the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Head over to patreon.com if you want to support this channel, and I'll see you next week.